The walls of the city of Jerusalem were mere rubble. This news made Nehemiah very sad. So Nehemiah began to rebuild. He led the people day in and day out. Enemies attacked, but they overcame. God helped them finish the work in only 52 days. The Jews who had once been in captivity now returned home. Change your world in 52 days. The story of Nehemiah. Well, we are going to be in the story of Nehemiah. I'm going to explain a little bit of uh, who I am and kind of why I'm here. Um, if you've only been here for the past couple of years, maybe you haven't met me or my, my wife, Angie. I had my son, Carson, and uh, my son, Preston. Um, he, I don't know where he's at. He's probably out there, too. So, um, and we're going to talk about the Nehemiah series for the next four weeks. And uh, we're actually not going to be here for 52 days, but 52 days is how long it took Nehemiah from the time that he heard the walls of Jerusalem were torn down to the time that they were rebuilt. And it's an extraordinary story that God does something absolutely amazing, and we're going to talk about that. But I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background of kind of where we've been for the past couple of years. And so it was a little over two years ago that I finished seminary through North Park or denominational seminary. And at that point, I kind of had the opportunity to interview for different pastoral positions all the way across the country. We looked at Kansas and Michigan, and uh, I really resisted California, but God spoke and my wife spoke. And so when she spoke, we went to California. <laughs> But God spoke through her, and I actually started at Chick uh, three years ago is when God really did speak through her. And so what we did was, uh, this is us now, so you can see, if you see those two boys out there, those are ours. And, uh, and so we had the opportunity to go from Ohio all the way out to Northern California. So that's kind of right where we were at there in Northern California. If you kind of know your geography a little bit more, you can see San Francisco on the left-hand side. And if you drive about anywhere between three and eight hours, depending on traffic, um, you'll get out to San Andreas, and we're in the foothills. So once you get right past us, you're driving up steep elevation uh, to go up into the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains. And uh, while we were there, we got to be in this town called San Andreas. That's the entire town. It was about 2,800 people, and it was a place that understood need. It was a place that that uh, had dealt with some real brokenness and some real challenges. Uh, we came there specifically uh, to be a part of Vitality. So instantly we, we went to uh, navigate, we went through the Vitality pathway, and uh, we came there for the purpose of getting the church from kind of a difficult place and getting them into a healthy missional church. And uh, we thought it was going to take three to five years, and through God's blessing, we were able to see the church become very healthy, very missional, and, uh, and really increase in size. And we were then able to find a local person uh, to continue the ministry uh, after we were called to be someplace else. So now God has called us, and Angie and I are going to be church planning in uh, Melbourne Beach, Florida. So if you, you, know, you know where Florida is, Orlando's kind of just to the west of where we're going to be. And we're out there on the Barrier Island, um, which is an amazing place that people actually live. It's not just vacationers. And... Um, uh, we actually found when her sister moved there that there weren't a lot of churches there. So between family and God's calling, we've been able to kind of make that. And, uh, and that's kind of the area that we're focusing on that I've highlighted right there. Uh, we've been able to find a home there that we'll move into August 1st. We believe we found a location for the church that's better than I could have ever prayed for. Um, we did pray for it, and God's given us an incredible location. And uh, so that's the next drive that my dad, who's here, dad here. Um, he came out and helped me pack up a 26-foot Penske truck with a car hauler on the back. He drove the minivan, I had the truck, and we drove all the way across the country. We have a very tall country. There's a lot of elevation change in the West Coast, I will tell you that. I couldn't go over 40 for many, many miles, and that's, it took a little while. So that's kind of been our journey, and then along the way, uh, over the past couple weeks, uh, we went up to Minneapolis to the annual meeting. Uh, Pastor Tim got to be the person who seconded my ordination. And so he is on the books, on record for being the second for my ordination into the Evangelical Covenant Church. So that's just kind of a, a recap of where we've been. So now we have the opportunity to be here for the month and be with our parents and be with family, be with many of you. 
And, uh, and I get the chance to be here for this Sunday plus three more, while Tim, who's been here for 17, 18 years, is getting a chance to have a one-month sabbatical, um, which does not mean a one-month vacation. I know, in fact, many of us are telling him to slow down a little bit. He's really trying to read and allow God to speak into his life and to really speak into who God wants him to be as he continues doing the wonderful ministry right here at this church. And so as Tim is away, I'm not just here on Sunday mornings. If you need anything during the week, um, I am available and I'll be here at the church some. And I, I sent out some ways to contact me. You can touch base with me on how to do that if you don't know how. And, uh, and I'm here for this church for this month to serve in any way that I can. So with that being said, let me kind of uh, share this. I, I want to speak. There's anyone here who you were the best looking person in your high school. If you were the fastest, if you were voted most likely to, su to succeed, if you were the captain of the, of the sports team or a cheerleading team, I've got good news for you. God can even use you. It just so happens that God likes to use ordinary people like me. God uses ordinary people like we're going to see in Nehemiah. God takes ordinary people and he allows them to do extraordinary things because God moves in their lives. And when God moves, it gives us the opportunity to do things beyond what we ever could imagine. So we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah starting off at chapter 1, verse 1. If you have your Bible, if you can turn there. Um, there might be Bibles in front of you. If you've got your phone or a tablet, uh, use your app to look it up if you would like. Um, if you're having trouble finding it, it's in towards the beginning, about a third of the way in. It's after Ezra and before Tobit. Does that help you find it a little easier? Let's see. It's page 453 in my Bible. All right. Look at the table of contents. It's absolutely okay. So God uses this ordinary guy named Nehemiah. Now you ask, who is Nehemiah? And I would love to try and answer that for you. Nehemiah, he was a cupbearer for the king Artaxerxes. So he was a cupbearer. So now you ask the question of what is a cupbearer? Well, a cupbearer, some of you may think that he had the best job in the world. If you like wine, you would like this guy. If you were from Northern California, you would really like this guy because they really like wine in Northern California. And what this guy did for a living was he would take the cup of wine before the king would drink it, and he would drink it. The king would look at him and make sure that he didn't fall over dead or have something really bad happen to him. If the wine looks good, the king would then drink the rest of the cup. That was his job. He was a cupbearer. Now, some people, I've, I've read a lot of commentaries. Tim has many more commentaries than I have. So I was able to reread some of this this week, and some commentaries argue that you know, he was more of a person who had the ear of the king, that he could speak to the king, put him in a place of power. Some said that really he was a glorified butler that was kind of pushed off to the side. But he was in this unique position that he was an ordinary person that came from the Israelites, the Jewish people that were in captivity. down, And his gates have been burned with fire. Now verse 4, Nehemiah says this. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now let me again give you a little context of what we've heard in these first four verses. The walls of Jerusalem, they had been down for about 140 years when the Babylonians came through and they destroyed Jerusalem and, and took many into captivity and brought them as slaves into Iran that becomes Persia. 140 years. Their great city that really is even today when you think of Israel, you picture Jerusalem. And that's always been a huge identity. It had the temple that allowed the Jewish people to exercise the, the sacrifices and the different promises that God told them they were supposed to fulfill. And so when the walls were taken down, they were completely open and vulnerable to future attacks. They really ceased to exist as a nation and as a people because these walls were down. Just imagine 140 years, the walls of our country being completely open. This goes back to post-Civil War for us today. Imagine this post-Civil War that, that, that our nation had gone through a great time of, of war and we never rebuilt. 
The nation was still open for future nations to come in and out and, and raid the territory as they pleased. I think we would all find that to be a time of great distress. And we know that this happened because the Babylonians came in, but really why did this happen? We see throughout the Old Testament and in the scriptures before this passage of Nehemiah that God would consistently have these words, If you obey me, O people of Israel, I will bless you. If you disobey me, there will be consequences. And sure enough, God's people, we see this continual path. And right before this attack, they had, they had begun to turn away from God. They were making sacrifices to other gods. They were, doing, they were doing things that were displeasing to God. So yes, the Babylonians came in, but the why really was because they had turned their backs on God and they had begun to live in a different way. They were living for themselves and to please other gods that do not exist instead of the living God that had given them these great promises. So the Babylonians came in, they wiped out the city and the people. They took them into captivity. They tore down the walls, their place of worship, and they continued to uh, be a dominant force until the Persians came in about 100 years later. And at this time, what we do see in a previous book to Nehemiah is a small remnant was allowed to go back. The Persians were not as anti-Jewish uh, Israel as the Babylonians were. So they allowed a small remnant to go back, and they kind of had a temple built, but the way it's described in Scripture was, uh, it was like I rebuilt the place. It wasn't very nice. You wouldn't want to go there. And, but it was a functioning temple that they were using. So as we see that there's this makeshift temple, the whole nation was distraught. What did we hear from Nehemiah? He sat down. He prayed and he wept. And then he had what we're going to talk today is what, I, what I'm going to call a Popeye moment. How many of us remember watching Popeye cartoons? They're not really on anymore. But so many of us, though, we still remember it. You know, if we think about what is a, a Popeye moment, you know, Popeye consistently, uh, almost every single show, he had his girlfriend. What was his girlfriend's name? Olive oil. There you go. Olive oil. And uh, every single time, a really big, mean guy whose name was... Brut now you're making me look at my notes. Brutus, he would, he would come and he would steal olive oil. And he would kind of start to bully Popeye and he would kind of, you know, rough him up and things like that. And then what would Popeye do? He would grab his, his can of spinach and he would kind of squeeze it and it would pop up and it would come in. In fact, I, I kind of like cartoons and so let's check it out. If you can turn the volume up. I know there's volume. I wanted to see olive oil. All right, he, he, he was about to give him the twisted punch, you know. So the part that the, the, the audio we missed here in the beginning, he says the part that he says all the time. If you know, say it was with me. That's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. You see, that's what Nehemiah said. When he heard this news that was coming from his brother, he said, that's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. Maybe you've had that story in your life. You've had that moment where you heard something and it broke your heart and it caused you to weep. It said he mourned for many, many days. You've had that moment where something happened and your heart broke for many days and you said that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. That's all I can stand. Somebody has to do something about this. And that somebody is going to be me. I'm not just going to go on social media and, and make a little you know, post about how much I don't like this. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to make a difference in this world because my heart has changed. 
You know, for me, there was a moment that this happened. I'm sharing this story right now specifically because this church is a part of this story. And some of you know the story that we had the opportunity to have a family in our church adopt a girl from our, our youth group who was, I think, about 15 at the time, maybe 16, about that age. And she was adopted by a family in our church. A couple years later, she was with my wife Angie and her sister Melissa over in the parsonage. And she was sharing that her younger sister, who at the time was four, um, was homeless with her mom. And her mom was making very, very, very poor life choices and putting this young girl in very dangerous uh, positions and places. And so as they were talking about that, and we, they were just talking about how bad it was, I remember walking in, talking with them and saying, where is she? Let's go get her. You see, we weren't going to keep on talking about it, but we decided as a group and as a family that we can't stand this and we can't stand it no more. So we went and we first picked up this little girl, what we thought was going to be a weekend. Many of you know her. Her name is Kiana. And we picked her up, which we thought was going to be a weekend. We brought her back to the parsonage. We got a chance to do like what we thought was like one of the coolest things ever. She had no clothes that fit her. We could take her to Walmart and buy her like three or four new outfits, and she thought it was like the greatest thing ever. You know, we, we would go and show her a refrigerator and a pantry full of food and say, you know, you don't have to eat it all at once. It's going to be here. And if this disappears, we're able to go get more. It's okay. And just walk her through just coming back into a, a somewhat normal family life. And it was an amazing thing. Uh, through God's leading, we were able to be a part of the process. And now to this day, she's my niece. And, uh, and here's a picture. It's, this is a little, I should have got a newer picture. Um, but this is Kiana with her brother on top of her, uh, Cal Baker, and my boys on each side. And now she's got an even littler brother. And she is so much bigger than this. And this is where the church gets to be a part of this story. I've got awesome news. She's going to be here in two Sundays because she wants to get baptized in the church that brought her into this family. And that's going to be an incredible thing. Let's praise God for that. And my son, Carson, who we've honestly been kind of pushing back for a year on baptism because he's uh, going to turn six on Thursday. But I've argued with him with the best theology I can. He answers every question, so he's getting baptized with her. And so it's going to be an awesome thing in two weeks. Our, our kids get back from Chick, and we're going to see some young kids get baptized right here at this church because God's done an amazing thing. So at this time, what I want to do is uh, I want to invite up uh, a friend of our church. Uh, his name is John Clinton, and uh, he's with uh, the Lutheran Church in Upper Arlington. And uh, he is going to share with us how God's done this to him in his life. Greetings from Delaware County. My wife Carol and I are very pleased to be with you here today. Um, had the chance to have a really cool God moment that became a God day and, and several weeks and months thereafter. Beginning on March 1 this year, I'm in sales. I to travel the roads pretty much every day. Um, many times I had the opportunity to run across people and, and give a hand uh, when the Spirit leads and when I think it's going to be okay. <laughs> One such thing happened on that Thursday. I was coming north out of Toledo and just a bit south of Upper Sandusky. I uh, saw a young man broken down on the road. Um, didn't look to be too terribly bad, but I uh, thought, well, you know, I really have things to do. I got to go. You know, it's, uh, I have other business things that have to happen today. And the Holy Spirit nudged, said, you can't leave that. Really? I, I got to get this stuff done. So Okay, I'm, I'm going to help. So I, I go down to the next exit, turn around, and I'm still grousing about it. Like, I don't really want to do this. And uh, the Holy Spirit said, I didn't die any less for that guy than I did for you. Oh, got it. <laughs> Came around, found him, pulled over, and uh, it turns out I had a flat tire. Okay, I've changed many a flat tires. Most of us have. And... Um, I try to break the lug nuts, and they're not breaking. It's kind of like, really? You need to get back on that uh, weightlifting program, brother. So um, I end up putting him in the car, and his name is Ali. And uh, Ali says, um, why you stop for me? I've been here two hours. No one stopped. No police, no one. And he said, why do you stop for me? They didn't stop for me because I'm black. And I said, well, Ali, I, uh, I serve because my king said I needed to stop. And my king doesn't see color. Oh, was his reply. 
Very interesting. <clears throat> so uh, he said, who is this king? And I said, King Jesus. And he immediately went into fix mode in that I'm Muslim, I, he, he told me, and we Muslims don't kill anybody. Okay? And to kill one is to kill 5,000 in, in my belief. Okay. Media tells me something different. And what, looking back on it, the entire experience is one that, that changed me. It changed my thought. Because I will tell you, in church, that the last person John Clinton would be witnessing Christ to was a Muslim. Wasn't going to happen. Had no interest, no desire, no need. Didn't know how to start that discussion. I rarely have trouble talking. Okay, into the story. Take him to a, a, a truck stop and um, find a way to get his car fixed. Meet the guy back at the car. Car is fixed. He's very grateful. He's very joyous. And um, he says, how can I thank you? I, I don't have any money, but I'll bring you gifts and I'll come to your house. And I said, um, no, that's quite all right. These are common things in the culture. The culture is, I divert, shame and honor. There is no forgiveness. There is no grace. Think about that. To come from a culture that doesn't offer that, the grace of God Almighty that lives within you. And he says, uh, I must thank you. And I said, well, just pay it forward, Ali. The next time you see somebody and you, you can offer help, offer help. And he goes, okay, I'll do that. And then I said, well, and on second thought, there is one thing you could do. And the Holy Spirit said, speak boldly here. He said, speak boldly when I gave this part about my King Jesus doesn't know color. I didn't really know what to do with that. Speak boldly, came the word. Same thing. You know what? Why don't you come to church with us on Sunday? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm thinking, hey, all right. I don't know exactly what to do with this, but I'm pretty sure that I didn't make this happen. All right, so I phoned my pastor, and pastor says, well, that's, that's wonderful news. Uh, don't expect to see him. Okay. Why? Because of their honor-shame culture. He will honor you by accepting the invitation, but don't be surprised if he doesn't follow through. Sunday comes, communion Sunday, serving communion, um, and he came. <laughs> he showed up late. A uh, sister of my wife's uh, was in the parking lot and found him and said, Ali, of course, he's pretty hard to miss because he's the only person of color in an entirely white place. And uh, Julie, the sister, uh, invites him in and shows him where we're sitting. He sits down, communion Sunday. He can't have communion because he's not been baptized. And I had asked the pastor that before. Communion Sunday is this Sunday. If he comes, can he have communion? John, said pastor, that's reserved for, for the body of Christ. He's not in the body of Christ just yet. Got it. My, my bride stayed with Ali in the, in the um, pew while communion was served, and that's important. We're going to come back to it. Well, it's always important. <laughs> Continue. Um, he comes to church a couple times more, and then on Palm Sunday, uh, we would normally have our time together and uh, uh, go out to get a bite of lunch afterwards. And on this particular Palm Sunday, um, Easter Sunday this year fell on the first Sunday of the month, which is when we do communion again. And my wife said to the table, you know, you really need to tell him about communion. It's kind of like, oh yeah. I said, Ali, we'll have communion again this coming Sunday. And you won't be able to take communion with us. Why not? I said, Ali, are you baptized? And he said, no. Pretty sure I had the answer to that one. And I said, well, in order to take communion, you must be baptized. And he said, I want to be baptized of my own free choice. I want to take baptism. Really? Do you know what you just said? No, well, no. I said, I, I rephrased. I said, what, what does that mean to you? And he said, I give my, my spirit and my body to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Kind of had a bit of an understanding there. We had given him a Somali Bible week and a half into our, our, our friendship. And so, uh, stop lunch, phone the pastor. <laughs> pastor, can we get Ali baptized? Yes. We, want to meet, we need to meet him on Tuesday so he understands fully what's happening here. Two days later, we're in church. 
He commits his life to Jesus Christ. The tears, the trembling, the shaking, the knowledge of the Holy Spirit coming into this young Muslim's life. It was there. He just broke down. And then, on Easter Sunday, he was baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. He is now our brother. And there's been much more since. That's another story. Coram Deo, through the eyes of God, in the honor of God, to the glory of God. Bless you. Uh, I don't want to call John an ordinary man, but he's doing extraordinary things through what God's done. I, I know some of the story is that God's continued to lead him with a passion and desire to reach other Muslims with the message of Jesus Christ. There was a class this morning that started at 9.30, is it, or is it 9? 9.15. 9.15. I was completely wrong. Um, that specifically walks people through this journey. Today was just an introduction. Um, the actual study starts next week, so you've missed nothing. Um, we have a great opportunity with so many people of Muslim faith coming to the Columbus area. And, uh, and it's about how we can understand um, the opportunity we have to offer the love and grace of Jesus Christ uh, to these people that probably many of you see on a daily basis now. And so that's going to be 915 next week. Um, I know uh, Bruce Bernard, are you leading the class? Kathy Williams. Kathy Williams. Hi, Kathy. Uh, she's leading the class. And, uh, and it'll be a great opportunity to join others in this church as well. You see, when you have that opportunity that God allows your heart to be changed, we are going to go through the blanks here. We'll get through them pretty quickly. Um, we talk about ordinary world changers. The first thing is, sometimes we have to sit down and cry. We see in Nehemiah 1, 4, it said, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. You see, that word wept, when I, when I read that, what that really means is, that's an ugly cry. You know what I'm talking about? When you have those times where like, you don't care what you look like. I know there's not going down my face. Don't tell me to clean it up right now. I'm in the midst of deep pain. And so I'm going to cry with all that I have. Every part of my body is hurting. And because of that, I'm going to sit down and weep. I can't even stand right now because God is breaking my heart. Which Now what's interesting is, he was a thousand miles away. And a thousand miles may seem far. I've driven about 4,000 in the past three weeks. My dad was with me for most and then my family for the other thousand. It seems like a long way. But they didn't have a car with air conditioning to go across the deserts of Iran. His heart broke for something that was a thousand miles of walking, if he was lucky, a camel or a donkey across the desert. And his heart began to break for something that would have been so easy for him to say, well, that's too bad. Oh, man, that's really sad. Maybe he would even tell his brother, you know, hey, let, let me write a check and I'll give it to you. Go give it to a fund to help rebuild the wall. You see, he was so broken in that moment. He was so broken. I don't know what has broken your heart. Maybe for you, it's kids that are hungry. Maybe for you, it's the idea of the way that women are treated and abused. It's the way that racism still exists in our society. Maybe for you, it's injustice that you see around you. Maybe for you, it's the fact that there are people who do not know Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth today. And you are passionate about supporting our foreign missions of the, of the Covenant Church and others who are reaching people from all over. Last week, we heard that there are people who need to know Jesus in the middle of Quebec. And we've got people, if you don't know, Tim Keener and I, we both started off Free Will Baptist 12 years ago. And uh, Angie and I supported his ministry then, and we support it today. We're excited to see what they're continuing to do to the ends of the earth. You see, what is it that God's breaking your heart for? And I'm just going to be completely honest with you. Sometimes things seem so far away, and God doesn't always move your heart for every single issue. Sometimes I hear, you know, they're talking about kids that are hungry, and my honest response is, that reminds me, where are we going for lunch after church? I'm glad you guys didn't laugh at that. That wasn't supposed to be funny. Because it's sad that sometimes our hearts are just, you know, we're, we're not attached to every single little need that's out there. But then sometimes 
God changes your heart and he breaks your heart. And so I just want to ask you that question. What breaks your heart? Now there's a blank there in your bulletin. And if you, if something came right now, write it down. But really, if you really want to pursue that, it might be something throughout today or throughout this week that you allow God to speak into that. God, what is it that you want to break my heart for? Do you want me to be passionate about protecting the unborn? God, where is it that you want me to go out there and make a difference? Because God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Here's the one thing I want to encourage you to do. When you feel that your heart gets broken like that, allow yourself to ugly cry. Allow yourself to sit down and weep. Allow yourself to be broken. Don't appease it. Don't ignore it. But allow God to speak to that. Open up your heart and let God in. And let me tell you why. Because God chose you for that purpose. And all the same thing, don't get upset when your best friend's not as passionate about that one purpose as you are. Because God chose you. And maybe you are able to rally people around you, but God chose you. And that's what God does. What I love to say is God can take that misery when he sat down and cried and turn it into a ministry. And that's how God can change our world in 52 days is when God comes into your life and he makes a difference. The second thing is we kneel down to pray. You see, this is what we see Nehemiah do. Nehemiah kneels down to pray. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. For some days, he just broke down and cried, and then he got on his knees, and he prayed, and he fasted for God to make a difference. You know, that's where we see God make a big change. In fact, I'm not going to read it right now, but you need to read it before today is over. Read the rest of the chapter of Nehemiah 1, because the rest of the chapter, the entire thing is a prayer. It's Nehemiah pouring out to the God of all heaven to go and make a difference. One of the things that I actually I love to hear when I was in the hospital is when I would come in when I was a chaplain. You guys knew me when I was in that time. People would say, well, all we can do is pray. I would say, yeah, all we can do is talk to the God of all universe, the God who created everything, the God who said, let there be light, and there was light, the God who brought humans into existence in his image so we could be in relationship with him, the God who continues to do miracles today, the God who continues to give sight to the blind, the God who continues to allow the lame to walk, the God who continues to take those who are, are stuck in addiction, God who takes marriages that are broken, the God who goes in and takes men and women who are in prison and gives them freedom, we can pray to that God and we can bring him into every single hurt and every single moment that God's brought into your life. That's all we can do. Man, I'll take that any day. You see, that's what he did. He knelt down and prayed. I'm here to tell someone you need to hear this today. Maybe you even feel like you're alone sometimes. You feel like you're alone in your hurt. You plus God always equals a majority. You're never alone. Bring God into your place. Bring God into your car. Bring God into your office. Bring God into your home. Bring God into your life. And bring him in through a, a constant, never-ceasing heart of prayer. And that is how God can change your world in 52 days. The third and final thing here is Nehemiah decided he was going to stand up to act. You see, I, it is good to allow your heart to be broken. It is good to kneel down, spend time in prayer. Sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, as we'll see here in a second. But then we've got to know that it's time for us to stand up and act. So Nehemiah just didn't sit around, but he went to the king, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, and he said, I need your help. I am distraught over this. I want your blessings and I want your support. We're going to pick it up here in Nehemiah 2, verse 3. He said, I said to the king, may the king live forever. Now this is a biblical fact. If you want to get something from someone else, you butter them up, right? That's what he's doing here. You know, he's saying, oh man, you look great today. Oh man, that robe that you're wearing, that's a really colorful rose. You, you really have it going good today. May the king live forever. And then he kind of asks him a question as he follows up here. Why should my face, oh, the king actually, sorry, I skipped this. The king asked the question, why do you look sad today? I've never seen you look sad. Now, why would that be? Because if you were a slave put in the position of a cupbearer and your sad face made the king feel sad for that day, he could say, I don't like him anymore. Off with his head, bring me somebody else. 
So you, no matter what you felt like that day, you came in with a smile on your face to work when you worked for the king. But that day he allowed himself to look sad. The king, uh, the king said, why are you sad? And he said, why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? You see, he was honest with the king with the hurt that he had. And then the king said to him, what is it that you want? Now at that point, he could have just taken the easy way out. He could have just, you know, just tried to appease the king. But instead, we see something really awesome right here. Then he prayed to the God of heaven. See, he had just spent days in prayer. But sometimes in life, you need to have what we're going to call a prayer flare. A prayer flare is just in that moment, like John shared. When all of a sudden you're in this moment and you don't know what to do, you know, John didn't have the opportunity to say, hey, why don't you just stay on the road for a few days? I'm going to go pray and, and fast over this. And I'm going to come back and see where God leads me. No. He just did a prayer flare. God, what do you want me to do? And God said, be bold. See, a prayer flare. And the next thing we see is that he prayed to the God of heaven. He prayed to the God of heaven, and I answer the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried. And he said, why? So that I can rebuild it. So that I can rebuild it. Who was he? He was a cupbearer. Was he a contractor? I don't think so. Was he a builder? No. He was an ordinary person that God called to do extraordinary things. He said, let me go so that I can rebuild it. I'm not going to send other people. I'm not going to whine about it. I'm not going to sit around and complain about it. I'm not going to post about it. Send me. Let me go make a difference. Let me go get my hands dirty and go be with those people. Send me to this city because God has given me a burden. God has broken my heart and God has given me a burden. I'm telling you right now, some of you are going to get a vision from God that you can't let go of. And when God does that, say, send me. We can see in Isaiah 6, 8, God, here am I, send me. See, that's the call that God's asking us to do is when God's churches of our heart, we're not going to say, let someone else go, no, no, no. I can't stand it no more. Someone's got to do something. It might as well be me. Now, here's what I love, is I'm standing in a church that I know does this in many ways. I'm not giving this message saying, oh, you guys need to be better. I'm sending you this message because it's in the biblical text of who God's calling us to be. Many of us are doing this. This church, this room was filled with children who came to a vacation Bible school where many kids accepted Jesus Christ. Many more got the core foundations, the songs that our, our, our family, half the verses we hear are songs that we remember from being at vacation Bible school right here. You know, God's making a difference through this church. God is making a difference through people of this church for men that are coming from prison. God is making a difference as the people in this church are reaching out to kids from all over the world who are coming to college right here in Columbus, Ohio. They're getting a chance to know Jesus and go back to where they came from. God is making a difference in so many ways. God was able to use this church to make a difference in a young girl's life. You guys brought clothes to her. You brought food for her. You cared for her. And now she's coming back to get baptized. God's making a difference through this church, as you had this young guy who didn't know what he was doing, coming in to be a youth pastor, went through seminary, you sent him out to California, God made an impact there. We saw uh, uh, somewhere around 25, to, uh, I never really kept track, 40 people over the age of 50 who got baptized because they've never known Jesus Christ before in their life. Because you guys allowed me to go out to California and send us out to do there. You allowed us to continue a closed ministry. You allowed us to start a celebrate recovery in a place that had deep addictions. It's continuing to be a ministry in that area. You see, that's what God's doing. And God is continuing to work through this church. You can't adopt every kid. But maybe God's asking you to adopt one. You can't foster every kid. Maybe God's asking you to foster one. You can't feed everybody who's hungry. Maybe you can feed 10 or 20. See, what is it that God is asking you to do? This has kind of become, as we go into the church plant, something that God's put in my heart. Individually, no one can reach everyone. But together, as the body of Christ, as his church, we can reach anyone. Again, John's story reminds us of that. Individually, we can't reach everyone, but together we can reach anyone. 
because God is doing something great. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I pray that your spirit would speak to us, that we would be different in your presence, and that your glory in this world would be different as you raise up leaders. God, I pray that you would change this world and make your name known. God, I just want to say that I want you to even increase the burden. God, allow people to say that they are willing to be used greatly by you to make a difference in this world, to make an impact. That, God, I pray that you can come into this world and you can make a great impact. I pray that over the next few weeks that you would plant a deep hurt within our hearts, just like Nehemiah. And, God, that it would drive us to the point of pain, that our heart would be broken, that our heart would be open to make a difference for you. And, God, as we come to you in prayer, we come to the God of all heaven and earth, that, God, you would then allow us to stand up and make a difference. God, thank you for the work that you're doing here. And God, thank you for the work. I want to pray right now for our pastor, Pastor Tim. God, be with him today. As he's worshiping as a person out in the congregation, I don't even know where he's at. That God, you allow him to be lifted up and loved and cared for. That he continues to allow his heart to be broken so he can stand up for this church to be who you've asked him to be. God, thank you for all you've done. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we, as we sing our, our praises and our, our, our love to the God of all heaven, the God who is faithful to finish the work that he has started in us.
Amen. 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 Thank you guys for being here. Kevin, thank you for a great message and encouragement and hope for the things that break our hearts. So go this week. Um, be faithful. Be obedient in the moment as the Holy Spirit prompts you. Be open. Uh, be used. Uh, let us share in our seed verse together from 1 Thessalonians 2.8. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Have a great week. Thank <laughs> you.